today I'm super excited to in interview Fion Ferreira uh, from Ireland. So he is currently a university student in Ireland, currently studying chemistry in, at the University of Groningen. He has such a great track record of being an inventor at such a young age already. He actually won the Google Science Fair with his methodology to remove microplastics from ocean water. And so today I'm super excited to learn about his journey as an inventor, as a STEM enthusiast, and learn more about his journey so far. So thanks for coming on the show, Fion. No, thank you for having me. Awesome. So as I was preparing for this interview, I read so many different accomplishments for you. And how old are you right now? I'm 19. Yeah, at 19 years old, you have won the Google Science Fair, you curate the Skull Planetarium, and love to learn more about what that means. You speak th three languages fluently and won 11 other science fair on top of the Google Science Fair, I believe, and played the instrument, uh, play the trumpet in the orchestra, and even has a minor planet named after you. So, okay, well, I'm super curious, you know, how you grew up, are you, you know, like, mini Einstein grow um, when the moment you're born. Um, tell us more. Yeah, well, for me, growing up was really, really nice, I think. And where I grew up was essentially in, well, if you imagine the middle of nowhere, that's where I grew up. So I grew up uh, in Ireland, um, looking out of any window of our house, you couldn't see a single other house. Uh, we were right beside the sea and right beside the hills and mountains. So for me, growing up was mainly outside. I was almost always outside, either kayaking, sailing, building little towers of rocks on the beach, uh, or, or, or cutting sticks in the forest. So it meant that I think I just um, was always outside and developed an intrinsic love to nature, but also to build things with my hands um, that hopefully combat a problem surrounding nature as well. Both my parents uh, were, were at building they could they could build wood my father's a wooden boat builder and i think that that also had an effect that i just um yeah that i learned how to 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 build things and prototype and and then ultimately yeah have a have a thing that hopefully works most of the time it doesn't though amazing so growing up surrounded by nature and tinkering with different creations from a young age uh, that certainly is quite different from how a lot of young people grow up these days, right? Like with iPads and a lot of devices surrounded. And tell me a bit about, you know, do you remember what was the first couple of things that you created? Was it with your father on some woodworking? Um, I can't remember the very first thing I created because I've created so many. Um, but I think one major thing that taught me so much about how to create was as a child, I got a train set when I was about, I think five or six years old, I think six years old, I got a train set. And I just built a landscape around that train set. And then it got more and more sophisticated. So it started with me then wanting to like wire lights into each little house and landscape and then have them like change colors. So that was like already a whole load of like wiring and electronics. And then it got more and more complex. So it you know, started like bridges opening and uh, like noises playing and all sorts of stuff. And all of a sudden I was dabbling in, yeah, quite complicated electronics of like integrated circuits and things wow. um, at an age of, uh, of seven years old. So little capacitors lying around. And uh, yeah, instead of stepping on Lego pieces, which I did my fair share of as well, um, it was always a 50% chance of stepping on like some electronic component or Lego piece in my room. Wow, that's super fun. And seems like, you know, just such a dream come true for a young child, right? Like building a railroad, railroad all around the house and, you know, making it work and making it more and more complex. So seems like your, one of your first creations are more on the mechanical side and, you know, engineering side. And, you know, have you always been interested in science and engineering? Yeah, well, I, on one side, that side that you mentioned, the engineering side, Yes, I was already very, very much engaged in, in building things, but I also just had this passion for nature, for being around, and I really wanted to know how it worked, how these plants could make their own energy to survive, how they could grow, but also I could see the, the issues at our seashore, um, pollution issues and things like that, and really looking at ways we could solve those. 
using science. So I think um, the whole engineering and science aspects both were down to just my curiosity to figure out how things worked and how I can make them better. Yeah, I can see how, you know, the pieces start to fit together, right? Like growing up surrounded by nature and it's almost like very integrated part of your life from very young. And, you know, having time to play with things with your hands, building with building things with hands, kind of built on that like engineering mindset and understanding how things work. And so have you read any books or videos growing up that further inspired you or like currently, right? Like what kind of books or videos inspired you on this topic of science and engineering? Well, I think that um, books and videos, uh, it's so vast. That's a constantly changing area. But as a child, I really loved videos um, that were surrounding like people visiting factories, like how it's made kind of thing, or, um, but, but also scientific explanations. So as a child, my parents only allowed me to watch uh, television in um, languages of either Portuguese or German, which I'm both fluent in. Um, but I wasn't allowed to watch in English, so I would practice those languages. Um, so I was watching a lot of yeah science programs where they would ex explain yeah for instance um, why the yolk of an egg floats on top of water and and the egg white sinks or lots of kind of citizen science science that you don't think is there um, just yeah explain for your own information. Um, I really love those videos. Um, and then I also love the ones where they would visit a factory and uh, show you how something is made and the technology behind something that might be really trivial or simple. Wow. Then so nowadays, I still love to, to read and, and uh, watch videos about science and engineering as well. Um, books that I love, uh, for instance, are Thing Explainer where it just shows you how everything's built and explained in jargon-free terms, like all the way up to like a spaceship. Um, and then I also really, really love videos where I see uh, people practically doing something in a lab, making things, um, yeah, making different chemicals. Um, but also I really love it when uh, people are translating uh, how, you, how a process, which would normally be done in a lab, can be done on a whole home scale. So everybody can investigate by themselves. Oh, interesting. So kind of like a home science lab, right? Like setting up things to, I think last year or a couple of years ago, the slime uh, craze, like a lot of kids get interested in making this little like sticky uh, piece of chemical or something. And so that, that's really awesome. And so before I dive into the Google Science Fair, I want to go into what you just talked about, where super interesting that your parents only allowed you to watch videos in Portuguese and German. Is that right? That's because um, both my parents are Portuguese and German. Um, although I could speak the language, um, to be able to practice it, me living in Ireland, um, one of the ways was that I would watch videos in Portuguese or German. So uh, that's why I... I would I would mainly watch in those languages. Wow, amazing! That that's um, you know very intentionally like instilling the language in your early childhood. So that's great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I don't I don't know. Maybe my English suffered because of it, but I'm not sure. Well, to me, it seems pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think there was a long phase as a child where I was speaking, you know, starting a sentence in English and the middle of it would be German and then I'd finish it in Portuguese. <laughs> oh, wow. That's very, um, that must be very tricky for anyone. It's like your family's, uh, you know, own language almost, right? Yeah. So, it's like only your, your family can understand because that's like a unique combination. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, well, 2019, uh, you won the Google Science Fair with your project to investigate the removal of microplastic from water. So you mentioned that you figure out how things work in nature. And, you know, what is the reason behind specifically choosing this topic, right? There are so many things in nature, so many things about the ocean that we can work on. Um, yeah. Tell us more about the process of nailing down this idea. Yeah, well, I would always still walk on the seashore near my house and I would see the plastic washing up on the shore. At the same time, I just really, this angered me because I loved the shoreline. I could see dead animals washing up full of plastic. I could see these tiny little plastic breaking off the bigger plastic and just, it couldn't be good to see it all there. And indeed it isn't good. 
And I think this got me thinking, and I tried to do anything that I could do to try and stop this, whether it would be just collecting the plastics to building machines to maybe count the different plastic particles or look for them in a certain way. That's what I really enjoyed doing. But then also there was the aspect of these, these, this hidden threat, the microplastic particles, tiny ones that you couldn't see. So I think the way I first got onto this topic was that I wanted to measure them to see if they were in the water. So I spent quite a bit of time trying to build a machine that could measure these microplastic particles. And I did, I built a spectrometer, which essentially shines light through water and then analyzes the light that comes out at the other side to find out if there's plastic in the water or not. Essentially, little bits of plastic absorb certain bits of light. And uh, that was pretty cool. So I could use the spectrometer to gather a lot of data about the water. But I was then looking for different ways that it could be reduced from water or removed from water. And really, I couldn't find any online. Okay, there was filtration through a really small filter or sieve. But that takes a lot of energy, a lot of time, and it gets clogged really quickly. So it's not viable. So at the same time as that, I was just, as one does as a child, experimenting with things you build by yourself. Um, I saw a YouTube video about this magnetic liquid called ferrofluid, which you can use to yeah, magnetize, make cool patterns with using magnets. So I played with uh, ferrofluid quite, quite a bit. And I think that inspired me um, to think about what was in the ferrofluid. And ferrofluid is made of nonpolar things, so oil and magnetite. And uh, magnetite is rust powder, um, just dragon busting. Um, but uh, essentially this mixture, I thought, well, it's nonpolar and plastic particles are also nonpolar. And in chemistry class, I learned that likes attract likes in chemistry. So I thought, well, if I mix these together, won't the plastics get stuck to the ferrofluid? And oh. that was indeed the case. Uh, so, I, so I checked it out and I noticed that I was cleaning up samples when I put them in the spectrometer. Um, and there was a big difference from before and after using Fairfield. That's amazing. So it's, um, you know, there's so much behind this invention, right? Like you are, you know, not, you, you first identify what particular topic you want to tackle. And then it also kind of involved this like curiosity and almost connecting the dots of, okay, you know, the polarization of like mag magnets and how, what about the you know plastic which is not uh like an electrical um magnetic thing so like so how long did it take it for you to you know from identifying oh i want to tackle this topic to figuring out this solution well i think it was a gradual process and i always got better so I started with just looking at the, the use of oil to remove microplastic particles. And then I thought, well, yeah, I'm losing oil here. It might not work perfectly. So then I added in some microplastic part or not my, <laughs> I added in some magnetite particles um, to try and magnetize it. And it kind of grew from there. So in total, the process was, well, it's still ongoing, um, but I started around 2016. And I think I was most active over the first year and a half mm -hmm. um, where I was really doing a lot of testing. And then um, I started going into the, the direction of, uh, of prototyping and design. And yeah, just trying to make it bigger, trying to make it more efficient, trying at different types of microplastics, different sizes, different concentrations of oil, magnetite powder, you name it. Testing that on a home-built microscope and spectrometer and it just grew from there. And now I'm at a stage where um, I'm talking to an engineering company um, who can hopefully really bring it up another step to a much bigger prototype. Yeah, so you're actually doing the videos that you really like watching or like the books that you you like reading where like the home experiments. And so I can see how you, you know, what you read or what you watch is, you know, indirectly influencing you and like, you know, oh, let me practice this at home and discover more. And yeah. so did you know you wanted to apply for the Google Science Fair or like, participate in this competition or was it more like oh you know I found something that stick and you know why don't I submit this to the Google Science Fair? Yeah well I had done other science fairs before in my home country and Ireland and uh, I really enjoyed the idea of a Google or of a science fair 
And then what happened was, was that I saw actually an online advert on a YouTube video of another creator um, about Google Science Fair that was coming around the corner and that was a great opportunity for ideas. Um, I went onto the website and I saw, yeah, you can win a t-shirt and you can win, you can win a Chromebook if you're doing really well. So I thought, yeah, well, I might as, apply, might as well apply. I won't lose anything. Um, so I applied with my project, um, wrote it up on the online system and submitted it. And yeah, that was that. It was almost by chance that I saw the advertisement. Yeah, well, maybe Google knows. <laughs> <laughs> YouTube, was, YouTube knew that Fionn Ferreira has something amazing to share. So let's target him <laughs> for this ad. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned that, you know, after, so since the project became world famous, right? Like you're all over the news, like a lot of people interviewed you. So seems like you've, you're still developing it and you've found some partners, like tell us more about the engineering company and if, if that's okay to share, um, you know, how, what are the things that are developing since the fair? Yeah, well, I'll share as much as I can share. Um, but since the fair, well, right after the fair, I was super overwhelmed with just so many different offers and inquiries coming in from every single direction imaginable. Like it, it was always really interesting to look at my emails. Um, uh, and then, and then um, as subsequent of that, I also had really a lot of opportunities where I could talk about what I did, but also talk about the idea process and help others. So I went to several events like um, the World Economic Forum, where I got to talk about yeah, my ideas and and how they can be applied to any problem solving aspect, um, no matter which direction. So I uh, am now just beginning with um, the major development stage of this. And really what I want to focus on is, is making a device that consumers can use to remove microplastic particles, firstly, from the water they drink, because I think it is a health issue here. And I think that if we can distribute such devices, then people will really learn about the threat of microplastics and then they'll learn about, yeah, the causes and hopefully then we'll be able to look at ways to prevent it coming from their washing machine and different sources. Mm -hmm. So I am working with an engineering company, I can't say the name, and uh, we're um, together developing a prototype where essentially continuous flow can be used. So water can flow through the device and remove the plastics while it's happening. And then what I'm really looking at is um, later this year, uh, licensing my technology um, to a couple of interesting uh, companies um, who already make filtration devices so that then these companies can uh, use my technology in their device and like that um, hopefully can improve and spread uh, the, the benefits of my technology along with theirs in a much quicker way to a lot more people quite fast. That's amazing. And so one of the things that you mentioned just now, uh, you know, the actually when you first mentioned this, I was wondering, oh, so what about like the water that we drink? And, you know, the first thing that I, I was thinking, oh, you know, it must be, you know, somehow filtered out or, or something. So are you saying, so it seems like you're saying that a lot of, you know, people's drinking water is still full of microplastic and tell us more about that. And what are some health impact that it sounds really scary to think about like drinking micro pla like plastic in our daily lives so yeah what, yeah, what totally. the situation there yeah so i think um it's really scary to see how many plastics are in our drinking water and although our drinking water gets filtered through levels of sand and stone the microplastic particles are getting increasingly small or, well, is that even, that's such a conundrum, they're getting increasingly <laughs> right. small, uh, but they're, they're just staying incredibly small uh, to the point where really none of these technologies will move them. And they're just getting so tiny that we can't detect them anymore. And these small plastics, um, when ingested, have a lot of negative impacts because it's not just the plastic themselves, uh, selves, but it's also the chemicals that they can transport and leach into our bodies. So the surface of a plastic can um, have a biofilm on it, toxins that are absorbed on its way through the waterways, but it can also um, have plasticizers and colorants in it as well, which can be really harmful. Um, so they've been linked to carcinogens and yeah, lots of nasty substances in the body. Additionally, these small plastic particles are so small that they can be absorbed into our blood and circulated around our body 
and they've been known to cross the blood-brain barrier. So uh, they can really get everywhere. No one really knows the issues, but um, I think it's my gut feeling and that of quite a few other scientists that it's definitely not healthy to consume these plastics. Yeah, and I really think that it's a need to remove these from water, drinking water particularly because I've just seen um, in tests from taps that, yeah, there's a lot of plastic in all our water. Mm, that is very unsettling. And um, is this like a global issue or do you see like some areas of the world that is like more serious? Seems like water is everywhere. So no one is really... Yeah, well, I think water gets everywhere and water flows quite a lot and uh, same as the plastics. So I think that um, it can really be found everywhere. I think microplastics are found more in drinking water supplies that come from rivers or lakes rather than those taken from groundwater, which has been filtered through a huge number of layers of rocks and things. Um, but plastics are still found in groundwater as well. Additionally, um, plastics have been found in the polar ice caps, in snow falling from the sky, and even in rain. So it's just, yeah, really a very big problem that's everywhere. Yeah. On behalf of the world, I'm super thankful that you, you've you discovered this invention and seems like it's pretty pressing issue for everybody, right? Like with more and more plastic in the water, it's affecting everyone's health and, you know, it's just a global issue that uh, needs to be tackled. Um, maybe like something that I'm just wondering, like, why do you think that n not more people are tackling this issue? Is it like from lack of understanding it or is it just like a not really understanding the mechanism to filter it out right now? Yeah, well, I think that um, a lot of people are um, not trying to tackle this issue because it's, it's one that a lot of people don't think about because it's invisible. We also have the issue of the big plastic in our ocean, which also looks pressing. And I think that all these issues combined are all very serious. And I think that the more people who work on different issues, the better we can do. Um, so, but I think that the reason why less people are working on microplastics, and actually there's a lot of people working on microplastics, we just don't hear about them that often, um, is because I think that the microplastics are very difficult. They're so small and uh, there's just so many different ways to, to tackle the problem. And really the only ultimate way that we can stop it is by yeah not using plastic. Mm, yeah, yeah. I think like the world is finally starting to realize, right? Like with more countries banning plastic in the next couple of years, and ultimately, it's really the consumers' p power to choose for the sustainable packaging and stuff like that. And so yeah, but I feel I feel also that it's not the cons um, it's not the consumer who should be blamed for that. And I really, really think that. Um, it really needs to be put into legislation on a higher tier and that it's not the consumer who has to choose between the plastic and plastic free packaging, but it yeah, it comes from somewhere else. Yeah, like like legislation is like sometimes really slow, like oftentimes very slow to change, right? So hopefully mm -hmm. more regulators and more lawmakers will wake up to the fact that this is a pressing issue. And um, so I want to switch gear a little bit where, you know, now that you have the, the invention being commercialized and talking with licensing, talking with big engineering companies, and you're also a chemistry undergrad, right? And so how do you, what, what year are you right now in university? I'm a second year bachelor. Okay. So how do you manage your time between school and your, you know, various ambitious projects? <laughs> yeah, well, I think, um, I find the busier I am, the more I get done, which sounds strange, but I find that if I am working on school and my project simultaneously, I just develop a useful work routine where I can get everything done happily um, and well. Um, I really, really value my time off as well. And in my time off, I might passively think about what I'm working on and yeah, how's, how to solve some problems. Um, but I think really the essence of it is that I love what I'm doing. I really love the studies that I'm undertaking. And I also really love working on my project and, and some other yeah, new projects that will be coming out in the future. And I think that um, that whole process is really enjoyable. So I'm really happy to spend my time doing it. Yeah, I can totally resonate with with you, relate with you in when when you say the busier you are, like the more productive and almost like you you get more stuff done. And 
you know, do you have some time management framework and practices that you, you know, some people talk about like time blocking, right? Like Elon Musk like to block his like create blocks of time where he have meetings or answer emails or, you know, do interviews like these. Um, how do you, like, do you have any practice or frameworks? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. I've never been asked this in an interview before. So I'm actually really pleased this is coming up. Um, but I really find that um, the, the time management is such a, a big issue and everything works differently for everybody. I've really found that, for instance, for me, uh, time blocking doesn't work particularly particularly well. I don't know why. Um, I get less done and it somehow stresses me. So, so I don't time block myself. Um, but what I do a lot of is waking up early. I work really, really well at 6 a.m. in the morning. I don't know why, um, but I work really badly in the evening. So for me, if I were, um, wake up quite early uh, and I work and I make myself a list of what I really want to get done. And I think that that list and as long as you, you know, you'll get better with the more tasks you do, but as long as you know that it's achievable and quite specific list, well, then you'll work through it. And I think that if I do make a list, it's almost always the case where I can complete that list. And I think that it really comes with practice, but for me, to-do lists are great. Um, I also really find that um, emptying my brain, so to speak, um, of nagging tasks and things to be done is really useful. So if I really need to do something, a task or, or, or something which I can't do at a certain time, I'll just write it down, throw it into my task management note-taking system, and, uh, and then, uh, yeah, I'll see it later. So I don't need to worry about it to remember a meeting or to remember, yeah, to buy milk when I go to the shop or things like that. Oh, I see. So wait, so the last point you mentioned was like cleaning your brain from the task, right? Like to not store it in your brain. And yeah, because I find if I don't, if I don't like write down a task and get rid of it out of my brain, I constantly while I'm doing something else, I have these, these things flying around my, my head, which might be yeah things I have to do, uh, which I can't forget. Um, or, or things that just came to me, oh, I should do this um, to, to work on this project. Yeah. And I think that it somehow stresses me or somehow, somehow makes me less productive if I don't just take note of them and forget about them um, uh, instead of like trying to retain them in my brain for later use. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, totally. I, I, I understand what you're saying. And um, I think I read somewhere that, you know, the brain should be used for processing information instead of storing, especially now that we're constantly equipped with like a mini computer on our, on our hands and we should like store it somewhere or like a notebook, right? And um, I also really like the part that you talked about making a list of to do every day. And I think the trick that you really highlight there, I want to highlight what you mentioned there. It has to be specific, right? Like something, totally. yeah, very actionable. And I, yeah, yeah, I really find that as specific as it gets, because you get more satisfaction, the more things you take off. So normally for me, I kind of make a rough list and then break each task up into four more tasks and then write them down. And then I find it's really satisfying to tick through my list, do things, um, and often, sometimes I might be in the list and I realize one of the things is not necessary or I can do it a different way. And that's also okay. But I think just having that in front of you or just having that uh, yeah, on your table is really, really useful and, and helpful. Yeah. And then I also really feel that um, I always rank things in, in urgency. So obviously some things are more urgent than others. And I think I really structure my day around what's very urgent. And then... Uh, the, the other things um, which might be just as urgent, but not on time, say, but they might still need to be done. I can structure them around the, the very urgent tasks. Awesome. Awesome. And so you kind of like gave us a little teaser about, you know, things that you're creating, you know, beyond the microplastic projects. And is there anything that you, you can share at this moment? Yeah, well, I think that um, it's difficult to share things because all the ideas are still in my head and also partly in the box of Legos in the corner. Um, but I, I think that um, it's just such an enjoyable process to come up with something new, try it out, see if it doesn't work, learn from your mistakes and uh, develop from there. So the things that I like, love working on are problems that are pressing issues, um, yeah, mainly environmental pressing issues, but also pressing issues in my own home 
um, maybe things that need improving because they just don't work or annoy me. Um, so um, it can be a very, very basic project or something more advanced. Um, I think that the issue of plastics is huge and there's, there's so many things that we can improve on the manufacture side of the actual plastic itself to the way we deal with it and to creative packaging um, solutions or, or different yeah, use solutions or reuse solutions um, for the plastic as well. So my ideas are varied and uh, yeah, I can't give you too many insights, but uh, I really enjoy the process. And although I'm a university student taught to think along lines, um, I just love the process of playing every day uh, with my ideas, trying them out and seeing where they lead. Awesome. So speaking of university, right? So your second year right now, and what are some of your early thoughts about what do you want to do after you graduate? I think it's not good to plan too far in advance because I think planning too far in advance really um, yeah, makes everything very boring. But what I do find is that I love the idea of that we can make so many different processes greener and more sustainable using chemistry. And I really feel that it would be amazing to work on future chemistry research projects um, really at the grassroots level of, of new chemistry research ideas. And that's where I would really like to go. But what I also really love doing is speaking about it. So I would really like to be able to explain uh, what I find so fascinating about the subject and hopefully get other inventors, no matter what age group, involved in how they can bring their ideas to reality. Awesome. I like that you're keeping an open mind and at the same time you have like a general direction of the topic that you're interested in and kind of staying flexible in terms of how you want to get there. Um, so on your LinkedIn profile, uh, you shared that science is key to combating problems. So can you share a bit more about what you mean there? Yeah, well, I think that science is a key to, to, to so many things because um, I think often at um, economics conferences, um, people uh, put head on head or, or put a, a uh, competition between innovation and investment. And I think that without science, without innovation, um, we really can't advance no matter how much money we have. So I think that we really need to, to learn a lot still about the environment we live in, about the way it functions. And like that, we can make educated ways to improve the way we work in symbiosis with the environment. And I think that um, we really need to develop this symbiotic relationship with the environment more and more. And the only way we can do that is by learning more about it. And I think science is the way that we can do that. Yeah, and um, I think like totally. And I think building on what you're saying, like sometimes investment or even like mostly public markets is very short sighted, right? Like what drives the next quarter? Yeah. Financials. And, you know, sometimes I think the whole environmental issue you know, a lot of it falls down to people not thinking about long term, like 10, 20 years from now. And so, uh, you know, having that longer term mindset and how to apply science to solve these problems that may not have results like next, next three months is really key to adopt that mindset. Yeah, and really a, a long term mindset, as you say, I think it, it's so important. Yeah. So, yeah, we've spoken a lot. And I, I think one thing that you mentioned a couple of times that I want to highlight here is that, you know, part of you doing Google Science Fair and creating this uh, invention for microplastics, it also gave you a lot of opportunity to share what you have created. And, you know, you must have connected with a lot of different uh, fellow inventors or creators, you know, tell us more about like some interesting encounters that you you've had since this journey. Yeah, well, I think one of the most amazing experiences I had was actually the Google Science Fair itself. So that brought together so many young inventors, creators like me. And I think that it was really nice because we kind of had this yeah, community spirit um, where throughout a, a weekend on Google headquarters, we all just got to know each other, but also got to share ideas and come up with ideas together and uh, work on ideas together. And yeah, it was just such an amazing process to be part of this global community that we're not just weirdo nerds. No, we're actually, uh, yeah, there's a lot of us. Uh, <laughs> so so we, um, we could work together. 
but I've gone to, to so many events where, where I've been able to, to talk about what I do. And people I really aspire to, and I would really, really like to, to, to do something similar to, are people who um, can instill through storytelling an enthusiasm to, to improve the state of our world. Uh, so people I find just amazing in their storytelling skills are, are people we see on the popular media. And uh, one really interesting meeting I had was at the World Economic Forum with uh, Jane Goodall and uh, uh, all her, um, yeah, she gave us an amazing talk and we had dinner um, at the, the forum. And I think that that talk really um, drove home to me how powerful personal experiences and, and experiences from different people and the way they tell those stories can be to make a change. Yeah, that's, that's awesome to both be connected with fellow young scientists and nerds that are changing the world, but also, you know, people that are much more um, far along in their journey and their, their development and their kind of learning from both sides of experience. So I can't, I, I must mention this before wrapping up our conversation, which is coming back to the planet that is named after you. So uh, tell us more about that. Like, where is this planet? And, you know, how did you get MIT to name, name that planet? Is it called Fion? It's called Fion Ferreira. Oh my gosh. Uh, and so so yeah i've got a little i've got a little minor planet in the asteroid belt um so just between the terrestrial and jovian planets just a couple of million kilometers away it's not too far okay my planet's about you know four kilometers wide okay. and um yeah let's hope it doesn't crash into earth soon otherwise you'll all hear uh you know a planet <laughs> young forever is coming close to earth to crash and obliterate it let's hope that doesn't happen um i've actually in my package from MIT, it said that they're pretty sure that it won't crash into Earth in the next 4,000 years. And by then, nobody, uh, nobody will know my name. So I, or, or at least I think so. Or at least I won't be around to have people complain to me about my planet. But um, I got it after the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair in Pittsburgh in 2018, uh, where I had the pleasure of being able to present my science project, um, which was still at its infant stage and then uh, where I could just show my results of, of uh, yeah, microplastic removal. Oh, the and same at this fair, the, the same project, but at a much earlier stage. Right. And um, at this, this fair, uh, MIT look at different projects that they like, um, that they think are improving the state of the world. And they recognize those projects by naming minor planets after them. Uh, so each year, a couple of students get minor planets named after them. And uh, yeah, I was quite lucky. And I have a uh, planet Fion Ferreira currently orbiting us. Well, we're orbiting with it around the sun. <laughs> amazing, amazing. That's uh, next time I look up the sky, I'll, I'll look for it. If, can we see it or probably not, right? It's, uh, it doesn't emit its own light. So yeah. like we would have to see it by its reflections. Um, MIT were able to see it with their quite strong telescope. Yeah. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, given the right equipment, it's possible to see. Um, but we definitely know it's there. <laughs> and you can actually use a lot of open source telescope images um, from yeah, recent recordings to, to look at these objects. Wow, wow. What a, what a memorable prize to win, right? Like there are a lot of these, I'm sure your, your house is full of different um, trophies and placards, and this one is in the sky. So it's so fascinating. Yeah, and it's really also nice to think that it'll be there when I'm no longer here. It will still have that, uh, that minor planet out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. So, well, Fionn, like, it's so great to have you on the show. And I, I want to finish off with, you know, actually two things. So the first thing is, you know, for a lot of teens out there or y even younger than teens that are interested in exploring and building things in science and engineering, what kind of advice can you offer uh, for them to get started? Well, I really think that it's not that difficult. So I think the first bit of advice that I have is that anybody can come up with an idea that changes the way we interact with the world. So the first piece of advice is that your ideas matter and that your ideas can make a difference if you just pull them through. The second piece of advice, I think, is that not all your ideas are going to work. And being honest here, 
they won't. But instead of treating something as a failure that doesn't work, treat it as something that you've just learned doesn't work and learn why it doesn't work and learn from that yeah, issue and improve on it and give it another try. And then I think another really important thing is to not be daunted by problems that seem really complicated. The problem with microplastics was at the cutting edge. It was just being found when, when I heard of it. And I just read everything that I could find about it. And very, very quickly, I happened to come to the end of yeah, the most recent papers. I was top of the field, so to speak, in reading about microplastics. So don't be daunted by all these scientific papers. Read a couple and quite soon you will know a lot about the topic that you're studying. And then finally, uh, don't believe everything that you read. Do try things out yourself. It sometimes happens that things just don't work or work differently for you. And that's great because that's where innovation comes in. And finally, uh, just uh, bring together ideas that you never thought would be possible together. If you think of something from all the way, yeah, one side in your brain to the other and link them together, well, the worst thing that happens that can happen if you try it out is that it doesn't work, that you learn from your mistake. But I think often the best ideas come from the most unlikely um, previously thought of combinations. That's awesome. Yeah, like not being afraid of failure, right? And also, like, this is all part of discovering and innovating. And, you know, if, like, most of the experiments fail, and no scientist will be re recorded by the things that the, the experiment in the lab that failed. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining this show. And for, for the audience that want to connect with you on the internet, like, where can we find you? Are you on Twitter? Or where, where do you hang out the most? Yeah, well, where I hang out the most is Instagram. Uh, so my Instagram, fion.ferreira, is really my uh, most common place. I'm also on Twitter. And that said, I don't post that often on Twitter. Um, it's just, uh, yeah, I'm much more yeah, at home in the Instagram ecosystem. Um, I also have Facebook. Again, Facebook's old. Um, it's not exactly my pri primary. But also, uh, for people who just like a plain old email, I'm in for that. Um, I've got my website, fionferreira.com. There you can find my email address where you can just, yeah, shoot me an email with any questions you have. But my Instagram um, is great because I can respond to lots of different questions that I have in, yeah, in the post. And hopefully that will help others as well. Amazing, amazing. So, yeah, thank you so much. And I'll include those um, links and um, uh, pointers on the description and the show notes so our audience can find you as well. Thank you so much again, Fion, for taking time this afternoon to talk with us. Thank you very much for yeah, taking time in your morning to talk to me. It's been really enjoyable. <laughs>